going back, I, re I remember summer of 89, waiting for a friend to pick me up to take me to go see the 1989 Batman movie. And I remember I was thumbing through a premiere magazine and I saw this full page ad for Cohen and Tate um, coming to VHS. And I swear I wanted to see that movie more than I wanted to see Batman. Um, but it but it bothered me that I didn't know about this movie. It wasn't uh, advertised. I didn't hear much about it. And I would have gone to the theater to see that, you know, probably two or three times. Or was there an issue with the distribution of the movie? Because I always felt like it never got a fair shake at the box office. It never did. Uh, it, it, it had a it had terrible distribution, which was, you know, out of my hands at that point. I mean, it, the film, I mean, which has happened on a few of my movies, by the way. Sure. Oh, yeah. The film was ultimately discovered at Blockbuster. Uh, you know, it, it, the film had come out, I think it, they opened it in 131 theaters somewhere in the Midwest. You know, it's some bullshit release. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I, th I pretty much felt the film was going to end up in obscurity. Um, but, like, about a year or two later, I was at a local <laughs> Blockbuster, and I saw the VHS of Cohen and Tate, like, featured on the rack, and it said, customer favor. And nice. Uh, between that, between... Um, you know, so, uh, cable showings, and finally, ultimately, with uh, the beautiful Shop Factory, and also later, uh, shortly thereafter, Arrow, uh, Blu-ray of the movie. It was, it, it was, the film was ultimately discovered some years later. Did it get a fair shake in foreign markets? Because I've seen a lot of, like, Japanese posters and German posters for it. Yes, it did, actually. I mean, the, uh, uh, they, it, they loved it in Europe. British Film Institute actually uh, ran the movie. They, they took it all around England on a double bill with The Getaway. It was actually a pretty good double bill. Because they're, uh, they're, the Conan and Tate's really kind of a 70s movie. It is. It's got, it's got a lot of the, the sort of the, the grit and the vibe. and the... You had uh, Victor J. Kemper, who filmed uh, Dog Day Afternoon in 1975 uh, as your DP. That had to have been something. That was why I hired him, based on that movie. So much is dependent on casting. You know, I mean, it, it, it is what they say, 50% of a movie, you know, and, and you have to be so careful with casting. And, um, but, you know, you know, because a script is really only going to get one. You, you have a unique, as a screenwriter and a screenwriter director, you have an absolutely unique symbiotic relationship with your star. Because the uh, you know that role is only going to get played once, probably. Um, you know, so uh, you know the the actor, the star that you cast playing it, you know they they embody it. So you definitely uh, you want to make the most use of them and trust their instincts, because they they're ultimately they're the ones that have to breathe life into it. So. You know, actors of I think you know his generation, you know they were they were tremendously prepared. Um, they had a great base and craft, um, but also, you know, they, you know, the great stars knew how to bring the audience in. They knew how to find something about the character that, that made the audience pull for them. You know, I mean, you, you, you don't really root for Roy Scheider and Colin and Tate, but you feel for him. You get, you get involved with him and his, his finale. I mean, I think his final moments in that with the corner by the police that's some of Scheider's best work ever. The end of that movie, and I guess I'll say, if there's anyone listening that is intrigued by this movie and hasn't seen it yet, pause right here. Go watch the movie. <laughs> I'll put links uh, below the video. But go watch it and then come back. But spoiler warning on, here we go. I've always thought, I think the end of Cohen and Tate is the most shocking ending to a movie I've ever seen. Really? Yes, because like I was saying, I, I remember watching it the first time and I was like, you know, what is this movie? It's just, you know, it's, it didn't play at the theater near me anyway. And, and I'm processing this movie and it's so different. But that ending where he turns around with, with that gun and ends his life and that huge sound of the, the gun going off <laughs> and then it just goes to black I was just my jaw dropped <laughs> I can't think of another movie 
that has an ending like that. There might be a few that maybe come close to some degree, but but not like that. That was a trademark in 70s movies, from French Connection to Dirty Mary, Crazy Larry to quite a few other films. It was an abrupt ending. The movie ended on a often a freeze frame, but some shocking final jolt that then you went straight to credits. I, I, I and and you're sent out of the theater still reeling. Because you know there was not there was no there was no easy letdown at the end of the movie. So yeah, it was very much a seventies a seventies ending. I'm amazed that the movie was released like that. Just as a studio would be bold enough to let a movie in like that. Even was that even a problem when you have your lead protagonist in their life like that? Well, I mean, remember his character is the samurai, and you know seppuku was you know that it was a. It was the honorable way for a samurai to die. So sure. That, that really is what it is for Cohen at the end, and end his life on, the, on, his, on his own terms. Did the producers ever want to push you into a happy ending? Oh, here, here's your little boy back, and everybody hugs, and he goes off to jail. Like, oh, no. Everybody was pretty much, uh, while we were making the film, was really behind the movie we were making. Again, we were trying to make something that was, well, of course... Conan Tate is really a reverse buddy buddy movie, which was a popular genre then. You know, I mean, it was, it has a lot of the dynamics of a buddy buddy movie, but uh, of course, black is pitch because these two guys are, are both dangerous, you know, hired killers. That's part of where I think the humor in the movie, kind of some of the humor in the movie comes out. Of. What did uh, what did Roy think of that ending? Oh, was did, did he ever? comment on it or do you remember the day you filmed that anything you can share because again it's it's an amazing ending to a movie he just played the hell out of it no i mean that was always built in uh you know i mean he, he bought the ending because that was the ending that was the the right ending for the movie and his character um mm -hmm. i can remember filming it just his i mean he, you know at that point in the movie he's all shot to pieces and you know he's a mess i mean He's, he's like a cornered rat when all the cars are surrounding him. I mean, he he really took that that moment in his teeth. It's a, it, it it's not just the when he shoots himself at the, at the end. It's that one shot where he's got the boy with the gun to his head and the the police pretty much finally corner him and he's he's like a he looks like a rat. Had, had any vanity issues at all. I mean, he, he, he played that guy like that guy should be played, you know, and that, that was, again, something that, uh, you know, I think that the great stars really aren't afraid of. And, and you know, I think that's, he made it a very three-dimensional human being. Yeah, it was just an amazing scene. Um, another scene that sticks out to me with, with with Scheider is when he takes out the gas attendant. He looks like almost like a king cobra or something, the way he stares that guy down, the predator and the prey. Total menace in that scene. Do you remember directing him in that, or did he just do these things, or? Usually I'd be setting the camera and would explain to him the shot. And, you know, we, we'd rehearsed it, we knew what the moment was. I mean, certainly that whole, the point of that scene was to show that even though there are human values that Colin reveals during the course of the story, we never lose sight of the fact that this guy's a cold-blooded killer who will not hesitate to 
do what he needs to do to get out of a situation. Like, you know, the, the scene with the gas station attendant calling the police. Um, so that was one of Roy's like directly villainous moments. But that one, there, there's, there's, there's one racking close up of him over him to the boy where he, his eyes follow the gas station attendant in and he's just reptile. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was actually funny because there were two scenes in the movie. He, he referred to his father. Um, now his father was supposedly the super nice guy, but <laughs> the, the, the close up when Cohen is first introduced in the farmhouse, when they, they blast the farmhouse. He walks mm -hmm. in a close up and he looks over the room and he, he gives a look to Tate of absolute just disdain. <laughs> I asked Roy, <laughs> where, did, where did that moment come from? And he said, that's the look my father used to give me when I did something wrong. Uh, oh, that's funny. And he said also the scene with the, him and the kid in the car had a little bit of that. He, he almost channels uh, George C. Scott in a way in, in that opening scene when he first walks in. The first time you see him, it, you're just not used to seeing Roy Schotter like that. He's, you know, he's gray, um, he's aged, and uh, Cohen doesn't like Tate. He hates Tate, and he hates being assigned to Tate. I mean, he hates the fact they even put anybody on this job with him. He's worked alone. Yeah, everything about this job is bad. He's got a sense of doom. He, I think he knows he's running out of time. All of this creates a gravitas in the character, but not just does he object a maniac like Tate being assigned to him, um, but he he despises Tate's methodology. He thinks that Tate is nothing but a bloodthirsty psychopath. In fact, that scene where they where they they break into the farmhouse, their characters are somewhat defined by the way they kill. You know, Schrader's one shot. Uh, you know, and Tate comes in blasting with a shotgun. The scene that was actually much bloodier in the in the original cut. Um, you know, so who these two characters are is fairly is pretty much established without dialogue in that first scene a adam baldwin was completely opposite of roy was that intentional like he was tall versus roy being shorter uh young versus old their total personalities are different yeah ab absolutely they had to be you know you had to have you had to have two uh for conflict and for you know dramatic parts. You had to have two completely different personalities um, who are in constant conflict and, and not good conflict. And in, in conflict that's that's barely, you know, that could turn lethal at any time. And Cohen's control over Tate is, is rapidly dwindling as the movie progresses because that's what the little boy observes right at the beginning and what he, you know, in a kind of survival of the fittest situation, what he kind of cunningly exploits. He, he pushes all their buttons to get them. His only way to survive, because he's small and vulnerable and unarmed, is to get these two guys to do what they do best to each other. Now, um, you had a great composer um, for Cohen and Tate, Bill Conti. And uh, just being a musician myself, I'd be remiss not to ask what was it like working with him uh, Connie was good you know I mean the, I, I wanted to do a sort of a classic thriller style score which even in the 80s was sort of beginning to it, it's not that it was out of vogue but it was it was sort of a throwback kind of score to more like the again the 70s and the 40s and you know something that involved the string orchestra and you know bill was pretty expert at that um i think his best cue actually in the in the, in the whole movie um is the the roadblock cue uh, because that was an extremely hard scene to score um to get the right build of tension and in fact so we got on the recording stage and he we recorded what he originally wrote and i threw it out and I basically had him basically write it on the sound stage. Uh, and it was fantastic.
do the honors. just needed something else to build the uh, to build the right propulsion it is a great uh key i know exactly what you're talking about that and that scene is that scene you know it's so believable how you execute that and how they get out of that mess um and uh certainly the music adds to that credibility uh but that that is a great uh tense scene there's just a few really solid tension filled sequences in that that movie i love the 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 sequence before you know cohen finally has had it with tate you know and, and he's like that's it and he pulls his gun and, and and shoots him i love the the building tension there as well and the score really helps underplay that i mean how do you construct that and know it's going to turn out to be so suspenseful or tense you know the, just use the roadblock as an example we've already established what these guys can do so what I love about that scene is nothing happens, really. I mean, they shoot, shoot a couple cars, you know, but there's the, the absolute potential for, you know, knowing who these two guys are. Uh, I mean, through that scene, it's really all about the threat and the potential of what can happen. And actually, as I get older and make more films, it's, it, it interests me a lot more really than action and gore. I think I'd, um, I did a movie called 100 Feet, which was all about that. It was all about the potential of things happening and what you think's going to happen and sort of playing with audiences' expectations. But yeah, that scene and the first scene at the farmhouse probably are now are my two favorite scenes in the movie because they're, the farmhouse is full of mystery at the beginning. I mean, who are these people? You know, why are there, F, why are there FBI guys there? You know? What's happening? Who cut the wires? You know, what's coming? Yeah. You were channeling a little bit of John Ford in that, like the searchers. Oh, I more than channeled it. I, I, <laughs> I, we, 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 have, we have a phrase we love to use in Hollywood called remage, rip off homage. That scene was a total homage to the searchers. Yeah. Which is such a great scene in the, uh, in the, in the Ford picture. Oh, directors do it all the time. We all use or, or iterate, scenes from other movies we we love and do it differently i mean I, there's a scene in the hundred feet that was inspired by rolling thunder you yeah you actually when i think of it uh body parts there's a scene that i always thought he's doing the cohen and tate mailbox scene where he takes the diary at the end and he signs it to his wife and he puts it in an envelope puts it in his mailbox do you remember that I do, but you're going to be, you're probably going to be surprised to know that it never occurred to me once. You're the first person who's ever mentioned it. And I have to think about that now because maybe it was. <laughs> it kind of never a subconscious to thing. Um, no, it's very similar, but it's a good, it's a good hook or what, you know, <laughs> put it in more movies. You know, I, I could see Cohen and Tate being a play. I mean, was there ever any thought of that or? just in how it was constructed. I could see, you know, if you had a some kind of ingenious car set, you could probably pull that off on stage. Mm. You know, I don't know if I've if I could if I could see that particular movie being done, that uh, being done as a play. I mean, I I know when I wrote it um because it was a time in Hollywood where if you had a couple of scripts produced, you could you could you could pretty much write a script and then take it to a company and said, yeah, I'm a, I want to direct this one and get the job. That was, wasn't very hard to do at the time. 
So, uh, but you know, you, you had to, uh, when I wrote Cohen and Tate, I, I didn't write a fifty million dollar movie. I, I said I'm going to write something that is basically three people in a car and some locations, and only to find out, by the way, that that has its own built-in problems. Because when you're inside, I, no sooner did I start shooting than I realized you had to shoot every scene in the car from fourteen angles in order to have enough interesting. I mean, interesting stuff to cut with visually. So I, I learned on that movie that contained movies had their challenges. Yeah, well, that's good. You had uh, Victor Kemper there with you. I, I, I did notice some of the on on Blu-ray it looks stylized, but some of the lighting rig shots in the background. I mean, you can kind of tell it's a set, but it it kind of looks good in HD, actually. You know, I mean, I, I was never happy with the car shots, uh, the ones that we did that we shot on the stage, the ones that had the the pronounced lights in the background, because Vic um, put the put a string of lights on a on a on a track and moved it it's what they call poor man's process um and i felt that like um i had him add like red tail lights you know so there was a key light backlight fill light the the lights were constantly changing in the car so it was visual um mm -hmm. but i don't think we ever sold the uh those it looks the the bulk of the car shots or a, a lot of them look like you're on a stage when they get off the highway like around the time they had the confrontation at the gas station, we reduced those lights to just a few in the background, and that those shots we sell. We just, I think, we just used too many. I was never yeah. fully, I, I was never technically fully happy with the, with the car shots. Do you recall what the budget was for Cohen and Tate? I think the movie with Scheider and you know the above the line all in probably around six million, forty five days to film it, so. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't really that low budget. Um, there was plenty of time to shoot it. You know, we had a symphonic score. It was considered at the time to probably be a, a, a medium, medium range budget movie. So there were obviously greater plans for it, and the, just the, the distribution just fell through. Um, because of course, you, I mean, Roy was coming off 2010 and maybe 52 pickup before that. Well, closer to the truth was that one of the producers was an executive at the company who was fired during the course of the making of the movie. Nothing to do with our film. And I think that there was a lot of, there was a, a genuine, a, gen, uh, a, a general lack of uh, support to an ex-executive's film. And that was... Oh, wow. So that has happened to me more than once. You know, if there's, cha if there's corporate changes that are adverse that's gonna you know shit's gonna roll downhill so it kind of it looks like mgm owns the movie now and they seem to be doing a better job of getting it out there i know it's available on dvd i see it from time to time on uh, amazon prime shout factory uh, did a beautiful blu-ray of the movie about a couple years ago oh yeah i've got it <laughs> it's available on a blu-ray edition here and also the uh, arrow did a beautiful one you know, I think the real reason probably the Conan Tate, you know, took a while to find its audiences. Um, I think it's more, the movie is more in tune with today's sensibility than it was with the 80s sensibility. You know, the 80s were flash dance. The 80s were very upbeat and optimistic and flashy and fun. Conan Tate's are really dark. I mean, I saw it again for the first time. Uh, at Alamo Draft House, it is a screening that I attended a, a, a few months ago. And watching it, I thought it was a pretty dark picture. Uh, but today's audiences, at least right now, have a far more hard nosed sensibility for its characters and stories. Um, and it's reflected in the movies and the shows that are made. Uh, I think that the 80s were just a more innocent time. So I don't think that Colin and Tate was really in sync with the era it was released in. But it was fortunate enough to be discovered in our era. Well, I hope people find out more about it. And um, I think Scream, uh, Scream Factory or Shout Factory, they ought to put out a, a box set of your movies because so many of them have that distribution aspect holding them back. And I wish you the best of luck with your, your future projects. I'm going to have everything linked in the description on the video. Everyone, please check out Eric's work and his novels. He's got a great imagination. You can certainly escape in his work, so be sure to check it out. And so thanks again, Eric. Thanks, Mike. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks. Thanks.